about to start. This is the first year that we're doing some form of state of Libre graphics as the introduction to LGM, uh, with the idea of giving, giving um, um, common update of many of the projects involved um, to get an idea about what's been going on in the community for the last year since the previous LGM, and um, also to uh, provide yeah, fresh information for people about um, various projects that don't have um, brand new specific things to um, show, but we still would like to know what has been going on in the various projects. <clears throat> Slide four. It is just a screenshot of their website. It's Blender. Um, Blender is one of the powerhouses of our free software graphics community, and um, the big thing that uh, made it difficult for them to provide us with slides is that they are very, very busy um, spurting in on their fundraiser for the Gooseberry project, which um, is going to be a feature length, that is like a full movie length uh, animated film, where they are um, Where they are um, um, going to also share more of their internal working process during the project than they had done with their previous um, open movie projects. Uh, I'm going through these in roughly alphabetical order according to the file names that I received. Um, and the next project is a project by Richard Hughes, um, who is an engineer at Red Hat, working on ColorD, GNOME Color Manager, Packet Kit, PowerD, and other pieces of infrastructure. But this is um, a project that he does in the capacity of his deeper interest also in color and his previous experience with hardware engineering. And uh, it's a project with a device that hugs your monitor and uh, tries to figure out what colors it has. And this is a project that has already seen some level um, of use. There is about 2,311 users of it. Um, but there are some issues. Um, it works for CRT monitors quite well. It works for some flat screen displays, but once people start having um, LED backlit displays, then things fail a little bit because um, some parts of the physics and uh, wavelengths doesn't add up. Um, and uh, what you really, really would want to do is not measure RGBs on the screen, but you would want to measure the visible light spectrum and do spectral processing on it. And there have been some people doing small um, ad hoc do-it-yourself measurement devices for this, um, using um, uh, the very, very fine details of DVDs and CDD, CDs. Um, but there are still not high quality devices and after having made the first color device uh, Richard wanted to try to figure out can you do this better and um, he's been doing initial research into it and trying to figure out um, how much would it cost to actually prototype and rig up things for production of devices um, and then there are some very very high bootstrapping costs and at the moment there has been 81 pre-orders and um, 81 devices would make very expensive devices and still he has been playing with prototypes and knows how he would do it if it were to happen and uh, the, the question also kind of is is this marketing issues? Do people know why they would want such a device and an open? Of course, there are uh, proprietary devices that exist. And uh, Richard will be giving a presentation about the technical details of the projects and also the wider context of how the physics of color works and uh, 
or when I fix together. Dark table is a um, raw converter program, but it's also a photo library management system, and it does all the processing in 32-bit floating point. The last time Darktable was present at an LGM and presenting something was uh, in Brussels in 2010 with a presentation by Alexander Prokodin. And um, one of the consequences of that presentation was that one of the main developers got to hear about Darktable in the first place. And um, he's now quite active, and uh, maybe that wouldn't have happened without LGM. And uh, the blog on darktable.org provides a good overview of changes since then. But some highlights are that it now supports multiple instances of filters. The way Darktable works is that you have an image and it goes through a fixed pipeline. Um, but this allows you to do at least some of the steps uh, multiple times. Um, some of the places where this is important is for masks, when you only want to alter portions of the photo, and uh, uh, there has been added supports for uh, vector geometry based masks, as well as um, masks that um, select parts of the image based on the actual image content, that be the um, uh, brightness or luminance of the given pixels, or yeah, the hue, I don't know the details. Another very interesting thing that they have added um, is um, noise profiling support. Uh, it turns out that just like in computer forensics, people can detect which camera has taken a photo, so you can characterize the noise. And such characterization models can also be used to know which noise to remove because you know what type of noise the camera produces. Um, and yeah, that is better than like a approach where you're saying, I know there is noise, but I don't know what type of noise it is. Um, there's dark table people here. They're wearing dark gray t-shirts with some orange dark table on it. And they like both questions, feedback about how dark table works, and I've also heard rumors that they enjoy beer. So they want all of the three of the above. <laughs> Floss Manuals is a non-profit project trying to create good documentation for um, um, open source software. Um, it's been around since 2006, and uh, I received this slide from the French kind of like branch of um, Floss Manuals. And, um, uh, I'm going to return in some of the further slides as well that refer to floss manuals and some specifics <coughs> and books that have kind of been done earlier this year. And now I'm entering a section of this update which is about um, fonts and typography. Um, and um, this is yet another book. It is outside Floss Manuals, but it's uh, educational, peer-reviewed, or peer-reviewed, or um, verified that it contains um, valid and correct information. But it contains details about the history of typography, the origins of our letter shapes, and many other such things. And uh, here's a book that is also about type design, but it's the, a manual or uh, a textbook about how to use FontForge for creating typefaces. And um, it was created uh, in a sprint with people uh, that say, well, FontForge might be difficult uh, UI and software to approach, and they sat down and sprinted and created um, a book. And um, as it says on the slide, the next plans for um, this book is to also start including information about how to deal with Indian scripts. Another thing that's been happening in the type design 
kind of branch of our community, um, which is an ongoing project, is Crafting Type, which is a traveling band of teaching people that teach other people um, how to design type, provide feedback for up-and-coming font designers, and um, uh, distributes the knowledge of how to do type design and the technical issues involved in it, um, trying to speed up the process of uh, bringing people uh, to a level where they can make their own type and don't make the mistakes that um, a type designer normally will do in their first year or two of doing type design and bring them much faster up to do things. FontForge, which I've already mentioned, is um, the major open source graphical font editing software. And um, there's been done a lot of work. There's hundreds of tricks and fixes. Um, one uh, new important feature is the live pixel preview. So you're no longer just uh, editing the curves. We can also preview how it ends up looking at different sizes on the pixel grid. And this also takes into account the hinting in the fonts. Um, so it can be used to have a very detailed uh, magnified view of how the details will end up being. Um, another new thing is plugin support. There is support for, um, if I don't know, it says IPython. IPython is like an interactive Python console with tab completion and other things. And uh, uh, I presume that this means that you can live experiment with the scripting um, on things as it's running. Another project is Metapolator. Um, when you do font design, you quite often design the extremes of how things are supposed to look, like a very bold version, a normal version, a thin version, and that's where you do interpolation. And um, uh, Metapolator deals with that, but it also um, uses Metafont, which was a project started by Donald Knut, uh, for algorithmically um, modifying the font shapes. Um, so the idea being that you would be able to um, uh, adjust different parameters of an existing font and then create a new version that you do interpolation between. So for instance, if you have one version of a font, you could algorithmically create a bold version that is quite good and then do the interpolation between them. Um, it has been used for creating a family of fonts called Sean. And uh, that's what the first version one was used to create. And uh, work is underway with a web-based UI for uh, Metapolator, which is an AngularJS application. And this is a project that many of us probably only have seen if you're building software, but it's one of the foundations of doing uh, type at all on our free desktops in our software, and that's free type. And uh, there is um, kind of a branched out project that has come out of FreeType called TTF AutoHint. And what TTF AutoHint does is that it takes the automatic hinting engine, hinting being when you are snapping curves to fit the pixel grid so you get sharp and small resolutions. And this has been a part of um, FreeType that has been quite good. But uh, then you have um, other platforms like Windows and Mac where um, they just execute the embedded programming code for how to alter the font shapes. And uh, font designers, they would like fonts to look similar on different platforms. And the TTF, TTF auto hint gives you the ability to um, use the algorithms that FreeType used for auto hinting and generate hinting programs uh, that Mac and Windows can run and then get the same resulting shapes at small uh, text sizes as you have on Linux. So you can get a consistent rendering um, rather than having like your method one on Linux and um, uh, the manual ones on Mac and Windows. Um, 
hinting fonts is a process that is often done separate from actual font design, and it's a specialist job. And uh, but this automatic hinting engine um, f makes it possible to get at least reasonably good quality uh, very, very quickly, uh, rather than spending months manually programming and tweaking how each of these curve snappings are going to happen. Font Bakery is continuous integration for font design. It allows you to configure uh, fonts that you're going, you want to have, a family, but you can configure it in such a way that it pulls the most recent version out of, let's say, GitHub or the Git repositories and um, build UFO, the Unified Font Object, or TTX source files and generate true type fonts from them. Um, and Google Fonts have been um, Providing both funding to independent font designers willing to um, license their fonts under open licenses. Um, and uh, here are some statistics um, from Google Fonts about how much they have served. And um, uh, it allows people or the designers to, uh, amongst the fonts they have there, they can make queries to know how they are being used um, while they're hosted on Google's servers. This is a screenshot of a project that I started fabulating about at last LGM. And uh, uh, font designers were complaining about one thing that takes a lot of time. Or I've, I'm not sure they were complaining, but they were bringing forth that this is a time-consuming task in font design, that is figuring out the spacing between characters. And um, uh, I was thinking that, well, algorithms should be able to at least help you some part of the way towards figuring this out. So through um, machine vision analysis and trying to figure out some horizontal aspects of the type design, how um, things could be made consistent. I came up with semi-automatic UI that helps at least with part of doing the spacing of a font. The goal being to get rid of a bad kerning. Um, or rather, this actually doesn't need to kerning, it's about the inherent side bearings embedded in each glyph. And then, there's a project that many here know me from. <laughs> Um, I haven't been that active in this project in the last year. Someone else, Daniel Sabo, has stepped up and has done, I don't know, a whole lot percentage of the commits. Um, I quite enjoyed at some point in the autumn to be idling on the IRC channel of Gaggle and uh, seeing that, oh, there's people in there that help newcomers that have questions and wonder about things and they answer things in very reasonable ways like I would have done, so I don't even have to respond right now. And yeah, the project is um, self-sufficient in quite a way. There's, yeah, in practice, there's a new maintainer, Daniel Zabo, and um, uh, Gekko has almost 200 image processing operations in it now. And uh, in the last year, in addition to uh, bits of Google Summer of Code work, uh, porting old GIMP plugins to Gaggle operations, uh, there also has been a university that's that had their students as part of their course in software engineering um, migrate GIMP plugins to Gaggle operations and um, submitting them to the project. I have done one thing, though, but that is in the last uh, two or three weeks. I am... Um, GIMP has been discussing how to deal with CMYK. Um, and the consensus we've been having is that CMYK is a subset of the problem of printing with multiple plates of ink. And uh, the question of so soft proving, previewing things, uh, has been brought up. And um, I have a background in color science, and I thought, well, it's not that difficult to try to maybe simulate how inks would behave on paper. So um, what you see here in the middle, you have a color image 
and then you have different variants around it where there is one, two, three or four inks printed on different color backgrounds and um, if, maybe I should do a lightning talk about this um, but this is also actually spectral image processing and might have some relevance on the spectral color hug um, you would need it to profile the things to actually how you could get the results and then we have GIMP and um, there has been changes in GIMP. It's steadily moving towards um, if being able to do a new release. Amongst the highlights of the things that have landed in GIMP in the last year is um, the addition of canvas rotation support so that um, you have shortcuts and then you can rotate the image and paint on it when it's rotated 45 degrees or 10 degrees, similar to how a sketching artist would rotate the paper as they're working. The, um, Deformation tool, which used to be a plugin with a tiny little preview, which was like quite nice, but mm, people have been saying, well, why can't we just do that as a paint tool? And um, that is a uh, Google Summer Code project that has landed. Seamless clone tool, um, which allows you to blend portions of an image directly into other things. Uh, there's also GXF2 for metadata. Metadata is a lingering concern of the game project, but Yorba, the people behind Shotwell, a photo manager, they have created um, wrappers and cleaned up metadata handling and uh, GIMP now is using GXF2 and uh, uh, has good attractions and APIs for dealing with metadata. Another thing that has landed is action search. Um, all these things aren't completely re refined yet, all the features I'm mentioning here, but these are the major things that have landed. And th this is a way of um, um, avoiding to uh, peck and hunt through the menus or the forest of many, many options in GIMP. If you know what you want to do, or you know that it is available, or maybe even for like, maybe there's something that could deal with something, uh, you type in portions of what you want to do, and um, if one of the suggested things is what you want to do, um, you can more rapidly be able to use it. The color management in GIMP has received quite a lot of cleanup and refactoring. And um, L Stone, um, a person who started first documenting and like the deficiencies of it, has now started also contributing to saying that, well, maybe everything isn't the way it is because it was intended. Um, uh, these people are also trying to improve what it's doing. And there's been tons of bug fixes and improvements. Um, Two nine, which is the development series, is kind of in a, I would call it a feature phobic state now. We don't want to add more features. Um, Two dot nine will become 2.10 when it's ready. And uh, when that happens, the version in Git will become version 2.99, and we'll use GTK3. And um, that development series will lead up to GIMP 3.0. Inkscape is um, a vector drawing application. Um, and um, they are working on an upcoming 0 0.91 release. Some of the really big improvements has been that they have ported the old internal rendering engine and now they're using Cairo for um, doing all the drawing. Um, this has led to more stability, uh, less memory use, and uh, there's also a measurement tool so that you can figure out distances between objects so you don't have to create rectangles and see it's like, oh, a rectangle fitting in between there is so wide, that means it's so far between things. There's also a new tracing algorithm, an algorithm for taking photos or other raster images and turning them into vector art. And there's many, many under the hood improvements. The current stable release, or one out there is like 0.48, and um, 
Uh, the next goal is Inkscape 1.0. This is kind of a public relations move because people are not used to how open source projects version themselves. And version 0.91 also doesn't sound that stable. But uh, the, the focus of 1.0 will also be to fully support the SVG specification. So that would be the go like more like a development-oriented reason or goal. Is like if you have the full SVG spec, you can call it 1.0. But um, Inkscape is stable. Hello, I am Manuel Quiñones and I am here showing a prototype for an animation program. Hello, I am Manuel Quiñones and I am here showing a prototype for an animation program which will be the basis for my workshop on Saturday. This is using the amazing library Google, the brush library from MyPaint and Google View by Sean Norby. So my workshop is about how to create graphic applications using Google through its introspection bindings. So if you are, if you like to program in Python or JavaScript or are just curious about Google, then see you in my workshop on Saturday. Cheers. And then we have a GMIC, which is a collection of um, image processing filters built on C image, a C++ templating based uh, system for doing image processing. It has more than 800 different commands and filters and also an online repository for um, adding new scripts and filters. Um, there's been more than a hundred filters added uh, in the last year and uh, the focus has been like for many of the ongoing projects there's been focus on uh, parallelization as it says there but that's performance and stability and um, today there is a presentation about GMIC and uh, long-term plans for this project is yeah even more filters more filters they have to collect them all. And uh, also uh, the desire for better integration with other existing software projects. Um, if it started out as a plugin for GIMP. Um, there's also no support for using all of the GMIC filters in Krita. And um, for GIMP, since we have been doing loads of refactoring and moving towards Gaggle, um, they might have to redo that integration. There might be better ways of doing that integration. But they're also interested in bringing their collection of filters to other pieces of software. And then we have Krita. And I'm struggling a little bit now with my speaker notes. Uh, and Krita is a um, um, digital 2D painting application. Let me. Yeah. And it's a 2D painting studio for artists. It's focusing on the use of tablets and uh, workflows that work well for uh, creating new art from scratch. Um, and uh, yeah, that's the goal. And uh, just before the last LGM, uh, version 2.6 was released. And in August, 2.7 was released, and new there was textured strokes, they had an improved transform tool, they added support for line smoothing, so that if you're shaking on your hand when you're drawing on a tablet, it gets nicer, smoother strokes. Uh, they improved um, how you can deal with masks 
in uh, Krita, you used to have to paint with opacity and the eraser, but now the masks are treated as grayscale layers, so you can paint on them with black and white, or you can use your filters on them, so you can blur your layers and um, operate more freely on them. They're no longer as, as a special case as they used to be. Um, another important thing in the 2.7 release was Krita Sketch, which was a specialized user interface for tablets. Um, and in March of this year, 2.8 was released. Um, with that release came improved OpenGL support and better on-screen rendering quality, um, stable Windows release, and improved tablet support. Um, and uh, also, uh, something following on from Krita Sketch, uh, what they call Krita Gemini, and Krita Gemini is um, a version of Krita that can switch between the tablet mode and the desktop mode in the running application. Um, so you could maybe imagine it as an extended full screen mode adapted for it in the tablet version. And uh, also features like a wraparound mode for um, drawing tiled textures. So you get the preview of how your image looks next to itself multiple times, so you can work live on the transitions between them. And there was also GMIC support, uh, which had been added. Creed has released uh, the Muses training DVD by Ramon Miranda, which is more than five hours of video tutorials. And it's also being used uh, by game and special effects studios. And for instance, Playcot used Krita um, for creating the artwork of its Super City game. And commercial support is also available for Krita. Krita is working this year also towards being able to distribute Krita on the Steam platform. Um, so many people. Uh, have Steam accounts on Windows or uh, Mac, and this will allow Krita to push also updates and um, might reach people um, in a different way than they used on Windows. It would more resemble how Linux users are used to getting their software from a repository. So, um, if, now in 2014, development uh, 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 is ongoing on Krita 2.9, which will still be based on Qt4. Um, but following that, when that is done, they will start working on Krita 3.0, which will be based on Qt5. Well, I just weren't maximized. Laid out is um, Tom Lechner's uh, experimental playground. And uh, the primary thing that Laid out was created for us, understood it, was for laying out multiple pages of a publication when you go and print them on big sheets so that you can fold them up and slice them out. But this needs bits of planning on where, which pages go where and how you do it. So he created his own custom tool for doing this for his comics. And uh, he has uh, improved the signature folder or tools involved there. He also has improved the graphical shell. And so there's a command line in the software um, with completion and uh, an expression evaluator. Uh, two of the other features seen here is um, a mesh-based engraving tool and uh, a clone tiling tool for creating like MC Escher-like uh, patternings and experimenting with them. Uh, both of these features, or presumably maybe all of this, uh, will be um, elaborated in the Mesh Conceptions talk Thursday afternoon. Then we have um, the Libre Graphics magazine, uh, which is a print publication about free and libre software design, art, and culture produced exclusively with free and open tools. Uh, they use Libre assets, Libre typefaces, 
um, illustrations and photos, and the magazine itself is published under the Creative Commons um, attribution share like license. Uh, the project was started in 2010, and there's been six issues thus far. Um, we titled First Encounters, Taking Flight, Use Cases and Affordances, Collaboration has been a focus, um, about the physical, the digital and the designer. They had an issue about localization and internationalization. Uh, the latest issue uh, was called Gendering Floss and was released in January this year. And the upcoming issue, uh, which is guest edited by Manuel Schmalsteig, has a focus on libre type and related fields, like digital publishing and open web standards. And so the people involved in such things uh, might want to be in touch with the uh, Libre Graphics magazine people. And then we have Scribus, which is our desktop publishing suite. Um, it's been a while since Scribus had a presentation uh, at on LGM. Um, this year, almost the full team is present. Um, working towards uh, Scribus 1.6. And uh, the roadmap is that um, uh, there's going to be a bug fix release soon after LGM 1.44. And uh, 1.50 will be released later this year. I'm not entirely sure. I'm maybe confusing a little bit the version numbering how Scribus is doing it. Um, SES, Software Consulting Services, um, is promoting Scribus as a tool for newspaper desktop publishing. And um, uh, they have uh, support in industry and have already contributed to other projects like GoScript and Poplar. Uh, many often requested features um, are in uh, 1.6. Uh, support for adjusting the vertical alignment within text boxes, support for foot and end nodes and styling them, um, text variables so that you can specify that this is a text and have multiple occurrences of it and update them from one central place, uh, custom bullet glyphs, and um, they are planning also to allow you to customize enumerated lists where you have one, two, three. There is, has been added control for orphan and widows. This is about when you um, do design, you don't want to get one sentence on the top of a page that belongs to the previous paragraph and then a big gap. It, it doesn't look nice because you're reading and you, yeah, so improve support for that. Drop shadows. Um, and uh, also uh, more extensive support for the modern uh, PDF specifications in use both in uh, Europe and America. And import is very important in desktop publishing uh, to support dragging in assets from a wide range of uh, applications. So uh, the um, PostScript PDF based importers have been rewritten and there are some corner cases with the Illustrator based files. And the interesting thing with importing PDFs in Scribus is that you can actually edit the PDF. Um, even though people think that PDF is like a output only and then it's fixed. And now I have for suspense. <laughs> Let's see if we can bake this up again. So we've reached Scribus, we're on S. We should be quite close to <laughs> being done now. A 
project that sadly isn't present is Synific. Um, but they've done a lot in the last year. A lot has happened in the Synfig project. Synfig is a 2D vector animation piece of software where you can, not like Blender, create 3D rendered uh, reality looking animations, but uh, um, more focused on um, 2D animation and vector animation. Um, Konstantin Dimitri, who um, has been spokesperson and person working on Synfig or wanting Synfig to improve, received a 5,000 US dollar grant from the Shuttleworth Foundation and decided to yeah, spend this money on two things. One was development and the other was training materials. And rather than do programming himself, Konstantin decided that it would be more reasonable to hire someone to do the development than he would coordinate it. So Ivan Mahoninen started in August on a grant working. Um, and um, added many new features. And uh, after the three months of funding had been spent, um, and he'd been working full time, and the project wanted to keep him, so they started an uh, Indiegogo fundraising campaign. And um, since then, they have uh, successfully raised his salary month by month. So there's been full time development. And uh, they also, with the money, uh, released a DVD focusing on cut out animation, um, which has been released and is also available as a digital course on udemy.com um, as a DVD and also as a pay what you want download. And, and in the fundraising campaigns they do, they have perks. So that uh, if you pay like a big, big donation, you get to maybe choose parts of the direction of the development. They have, uh, but they provide the things that uh, you can choose. Um, and amongst things that they have had on the option of what you can choose, you can choose which platform the developer is using for his development. <laughs> and yeah, it's reasonable. If you're sitting on Windows doing your development, you will notice those things that people just cross compiling and uh, someone else deals with the Windows version wouldn't notice. So, things that have been added is um, single window UI, a new file formats for embedding external files and having a revision history and have a new basic frame by frame drawing animation tool, a bone rigging system and more. And activity causes more activity. So because they know how to fully fund the developer doing things, other people in the community saw that, oh, things are happening and people get excited and um, uh, then suddenly, because there was this momentum, they have also received features like a dynamic system, like physics simulation for creating animation by Carlos Lopez. There's various general UI optimizations and cleanup by Yu Chen, and many bugs and small features has also seen development love. Um, there's weekly development reports on the Synthetic website. Um, and then we have Upstage, which is an artist-led platform for cyber performance. Um, I didn't quite understand what that meant the first time I heard it. Uh, it's a project for um, uh, using the web browser as a distributed theater, where the actors sit in one place and do chatting and create animations, and other people are watching in on the multimedia experience that is created live. Uh, it's a project that is 10 years old. And uh, they had a celebration in January um, and a planning meeting for version 3. Um, but they're also working on a new rewrite of um, Upstage called Downstage because the map, web has moved forwards when it comes to standards and capabilities. And um, uh, the new version uh, would make use of uh, the abilities of playing back video and media files from uh, um, external servers and yeah, using the web as a more open platform for their 
uh, system. And here are some screenshots of some of the performances they had at their 10 year anniversary in January, and uh, watched by audiences from the entire world simultaneously. And um, on their website, upstate.org.nz, uh, you can see the festival show reels and dates for upcoming performances. Then we have another project, which uh, is the Valentina project, which uh, is a project um, working on parametric um, design of textiles. So the idea being that you have the measurements of a person, um, and then this tool would provide you with the, you are just like different measurements of the, person and then you could get tailor uh, made uh, pieces of cloth and how they should be cut to create something that fits the person. So it's a project that takes maybe you could say like a meta font for the people familiar with that part of things approach to garment design. And uh, Compared to how it has been in earlier LGMs, when uh, Susan Spencer has started presenting and working on this, there is now many more people working on it. And uh, that was the last project I had in the alphabet.